Gabourey Sidibe is an award-winning actress who is perhaps best known for the title role of Precious, based on the novel Push by Sapphire, and for which she received Academy Award and Golden Globe nominations for Best Actress. Miss Sidibe has since starred as Queenie in FX's American horror story, Coven, and Denise in Difficult People, and may currently be seen as Becky on Fox's hit sensation, Empire. This is Just My Face is her first book. Glamour calls it a read that lives up to the unforgettable attitude of its name. This is Just My Face will make you fall in love with this funny, talented, gorgeous, bad bitch of a woman. <laughs> Glamour's words, not mine. Tonight, our guest will be interviewed by broadcaster and journalist Tracy Matisak, who is also bad, but in a good way. Please welcome Gabourey Sidibe and Tracy Matisak. Hi. Yeah, well, this how about is like 20 people. Right. <laughs> how about joining me in a warm Philadelphia welcome for Gabourey Sidibe? <laughs> Thank you. So if you've been to our author events before, you know that um, I will be chatting with Gabourey for a little bit, but we want to open up the floor for your questions as well. So when we get to that point, we'll have some people with microphones, and uh, we'd love to take some of your questions as well for Gabourey. So with that said, let's talk about this is just my face, try not to stare. Um, Gabourey, one of the most striking characteristics about this book to me was your transparency uh, about your family, about your emotional struggles, about your weight, about your previous jobs. Um, <laughs> what was it that prompted you to open up your life in such an honest way? Well, I, uh, okay, so, this all started with an essay that I wrote about how annoyed I am when people ask me um, where I get my confidence. Because it's not, oh, where do you get your confidence? It's where do you get your confidence? Mm -hmm. It's like this idea that I'm confident, but I shouldn't be, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I wrote about it, but like I didn't realize that I was angry about it or that I had um, any emotions about it really other than annoyance. Um, but writing the first sentence, I was really annoyed and by the time I wrote the last sentence, ooh, I made out with that a little bit. But <laughs> by the time I got to the last sentence of the essay, I felt relieved by it. Uh, I felt so much better and it didn't annoy me or stir me anymore because I'd figured my way through it. Um, and so that's when I started writing the book, I think, I think I thought of it as just like, oh, I'll write funny stories about what it's like to be on red carpets and be nominated for an award. I don't know why that's my inside voice, but it is. <laughs> and I went with it. <laughs> but I thought it would be like funny stories there's also like this weird thing about me i get, it's like a weird it, i like i hate dinosaurs um and it's not it's not even the dinosaur it's that everybody loves dinosaurs and i just feel like you're wrong but i thought it would be like stories about that but those stories didn't make me feel as good as the stories where i have to write about uh having gone to foster care when I was six years old. That's like something you'll find in the book, you'll read it. But, um, or uh, my parents' marriage, or what it's like when uh, the internet tells everyone that I died. I write a chapter about um, a death hoax uh, that was seen about myself, that was you know, spread around, that prompted my dad, who I wasn't even talking to at the time, to call me because he thought I was dead. And I think that like, you think it's super funny for a while until your parents leave you a voicemail um, because they think you're dead. <laughs> like, and I don't know, like, am I gonna get that voicemail in heaven too? Um, it's weird. But, <laughs> but I realized that these stories made me feel better and they are uh, very open and very honest because I wanted to get the work um, that you get, the work on yourself. 
Mm. Um, that you get from being honest. And so I, it was therapeutic. Absolutely therapeutic. Yeah. And cathartic, just so much. Yeah, yeah. And it's tough, but I feel like a better person. I feel really settled mm. about a lot of things in my life now. So you mentioned your parents, and I'm curious to know if either of them have yet read the book, because you said some things. I mean, you shared some stories about your parents, um, not all of them flattering, but I think very real, very human, and I'm curious to know if either of them have read it and, and what they think about it. Uh, no, my mom, uh, two, when I, I wrote a chapter about my parents' marriage and my mom read that two years ago and she was really, really proud of me, uh, which is really great uh, and she didn't mind how honest I was being, but at that point I wasn't talking to my father. Like at the beginning of writing, the, it took three years to write the book. Um, and at the beginning, I wasn't talking to my dad, but I figured out a way to forgive him for whatever reason and to see, the, there's, so this weird thing happens, they don't tell you as a child that at some point you'll have to see your parents as human <laughs> and, and not the gods that you think that they are. Um, and I had to write this book to get through that process. And I, they haven't read it yet, <laughs> outside of this one chapter that my mom wrote my dad knows what's in it and I know that uh, I know that my parents love me either way um, but I think that if they did read the book that they would see that I I see them and I, I just think the most important thing in the world for me is to know that I'm seen and not like to be famous it's not that it's not I want you to see who I am and my intentions as a person and I see my parents now yeah yeah. Um, you mentioned your mom, and um, your mom is famous in her own right, really. Yeah. Um, she is a wonderful singer, um, and really her rise to fame, if you will, started underground um, when she was singing in the subway, and you were pretty young at that point. You were, I believe, living with your aunt, you and your mom and your brother. Yes. Right? So my mom and my dad got divorced, and we let, we, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Bed Stuy? Nobody, this is Philly. It's Philly. You, you betrayed your own Phillyness. You betrayed. I will tell Will Smith. He will find out about this. Um, I'm, from, I'm from Brooklyn originally, and uh, when my parents separated, we moved to uh, Harlem to live with my aunt. And my mom, who was a teacher at the time, I was in fourth grade, she quit teaching in order to sing in the subway because my mom's like a really phenomenal singer. And she just wanted to see if she could uh, make a living by being a subway singer or a busker, which is, I guess, another term from it, so, for it. And so that's how my mom raised my brother and I as a single parent by singing in the subway yeah. for tips yeah. and she's you know she's phenomenal she's like been on the Apollo and she say, she was in Washington singing the um, the national anthem uh, last night or two nights ago she'll be at the Yankee game this uh, Saturday singing what's the Philly base is it the Phillies yes. yep. yeah I noticed y'all didn't say nothing about the Yankees <laughs> <laughs> Will Smith would be so proud of you guys. You're doing so good. Uh, but yeah, my mom's a, a pretty, pretty great singer. Yeah. yeah. Well, there is a passage, Gabourey, uh, from the book that I would love if you would read for us. It talks about your time in the subway with your mom when she was singing. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, I've marked the beginning and we flip over Ooh. just to that mark right there. So okay. if, if you wouldn't mind reading that to us. They didn't tell me when I was going to write this book that they would make me read. <laughs> okay. My mom would take us with her when she sang in the subway on weekends and in evenings because my aunt didn't like us in the house by ourselves. Ahmed, that's my brother. Ahmed and I would sit together on a bench on the platform and watch people commute to and from work. Commute to and from their homes. Commute to and from fancier lives than ours. My mother could always command a crowd to stand around and watch her in awe. Some people would miss their trains to listen to her sing their favorite song. People would dance and sing along. She made them forget about their long days in the office. She made people happy. I watched her work her magic on everyone, everyone but me. I watched her and I was scared. I was scared of more than just being evicted by my aunt, more than just my mom getting sick. Watching all of those people put money in my mom's bag as she sang made me worry 
that someone was watching her and waiting to knock her down and steal that money from her, from us. I was afraid that she would get hurt. I was also afraid that one day I'd have to do what she was doing, that I'd have to grow up and become a singer in the subway like her, but that I wouldn't be as good as her because I wasn't as good as her. That's a lot to worry about as a child. Yeah. <laughs> That is a lot to worry about as a child. And I wonder, Gabourie, if some of that worry that you internalized as a little girl may have contributed to then the depression and the anxiety that you struggled with in later years. Absolutely. All right, you guys didn't read the book. There's some anxiety and depression stuff in it. <laughs> Just so we're all caught up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I... I I have been struggling with anxiety uh, since then. And I think that was the year that I, it really started, I started having panic attacks. The world was changing too much and too fast. Uh, my parents were separated. My dad had a new wife. This is a scandal, you guys. Like my dad married a whole other woman while being married to my mom. And they already had a kid that was in Africa. I'm Senegalese, he had family there. And there was another baby on the way. So there was a whole family literally moving into our space as we were moving into um, twin beds in my aunt's house. Yeah. And my mom, who was a teacher in my school, who like, I would go like, oh my God. So <laughs> I'd be at school and it's math and I hate math and I'd ask for the pass to go to the bathroom and I would go down to my mom's class and I would just hang out with her for like 15 minutes. I'd say what up to her. Her students were differently abled. And so um, I could just hang out there. <laughs> you know, I could go take a break from like children Ugh. And, and then I could go take a break and sit with my mom and all of a sudden she wasn't there anymore. And I, the world changed too fast for me. I was nine years old and I had all of these anxieties. Um, and it just, it never got checked, you know? Like no, one, like no one saw me. No one saw me be anxious. No one saw me worry. No one saw me have panic attacks. Um, I was just, you know, I was called a crybaby. I would cry and have panic attacks, like, and I would, you know, just like, you need to toughen up and you need to get a thicker skin and all these things. And it wasn't until I was 19 years old that I was like, you know what, I'm so tired of not being normal. I'm so tired of feeling this way. And I got my own help on my own because even if no one around saw me, I saw me, um, which is really important. If no one sees you, that's on them. You gotta see you. It's just what it is. <laughs> but I say all that to say that, yeah, nah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, and then there was some... <laughs> <laughs> For sure. And then there was bulimia as well in your college years. Yeah, so I think that, like, I, I don't know if anyone ever, I mean, look, you can stay anonymous. I, you know, I'm not going to make anybody, like, raise their hand. But um, if anyone's ever dealt with a uh, depression or a mental disorder or any of these, or just, like, regular day-to-day -day anxi anxiety, there are ways that you kind of, uh, you figure out ways to soothe yourself um, that are not always healthy. Mm -hmm. And I realized, yes, I had kind of an eating disorder. And well, I say kind of like it wasn't. It was a straight up eating disorder, you guys. Um, <laughs> I, I would not eat for days. Um, and then when I, whenever I was panicking and I couldn't stop crying, I would drink a bottle of water and then I would throw it up. And it wasn't about losing weight. Like, yeah, I was fat, but it wasn't about that. It was, um, I realized that after throwing up, I wasn't crying anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, that's a great way to distract myself because I'm 19 and my brain isn't fully formed, so I'm an idiot. And that's just like one of the things I did yeah. to, to self-soothe. Yeah. Um, and I didn't do it for long, um, three years, which I know mm. that, you know, that does sound weird. And for long, three years, that's like over 900 days, that's a thousand something days. But um, it could have been much worse. It could have really, really taken me down. Yeah. Well, and you did, as you say, you saw yourself, you availed yourself of therapy, 
which really seemed to help. But I, I wonder, as awful as the depression must have been, it seems like, in a way, it helped lead you into acting, right? Because you ended up spending that summer with your friend. Absolutely. I be, okay, so yes. I, um, yeah. So I was super depressed, had the eating disorder, and I had to drop out of college in order to do uh, uh, dialectical behavioral therapy uh, for six months and five days a week. Like, it was a whole thing. I couldn't afford to go to school anymore. But then I spent the summer with my best friend who was at college to be an actress, and I was bored, and so I just would do plays with her, and that did kind of lead me to being an actor, and I say that, you know what, I believe everywhere, I just think, I believe in like sliding doors and the butterfly effect and things like that. I think everywhere I am, I'm supposed to be there. And I'm always like looking for signs. Like yesterday I was walking to a synagogue and there was a, uh, there was a, I saw a rainbow on the steps at like 7 p.m. And I was like, how did this rainbow get here? Oh, it's me. <laughs> like, like, just like, you know what I mean? Everything's about me, you guys. Um, <laughs> but like this, I, I look for signs to tell me yeah. this is what, this is your door. Yeah. This is where you're supposed to be. And uh, even like leaving Brooklyn, like my dad's like marriage and leaving Brooklyn, if I, if I hadn't left Brooklyn, who would I be? Like, and it, and it really, I mean, like when you read the book, you're gonna be like, what? Like when you, like me being an actress was a matter of being on the left side of the street versus the right side of the street. It's just, it really was that. Um, and I'm so grateful that I don't have to, that I'm guiding myself in a sense, but I'm just looking for the signs. I'm yeah. just paying attention. Well, speaking of that, there were so many signs that led you to the audition for Precious. It's, it's amazing the way that that played out, especially considering the fact that you really didn't have a lot of acting experience, I mean, besides the college shows. Yeah, no, I was, in, I was um, a pirate in Peter Pan. End of list. Um, <laughs> and I was Glinda the Good Witch in The Wiz um, because Glinda had three, so Glinda had, okay, she originally had three songs and then they just gave me three other solos and other people's songs because I could, I could sing pretty well. Again, because my mom's, it's probably DNA or whatever, were just amazing. Um, but, but I thought, okay, so maybe I can be a singer. It wasn't about acting and so like it's weird. So yeah, okay, so when you, it's, yeah, okay, so here's the thing. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> Uh, so my dad's second wife happened to be a psychic, um, which I mean, I, I, to this day, I don't know if she was really psychic or not, but that's how she made her money and get it, <laughs> get your coins, ma'am. Um, <laughs> when I was nine years old, I asked for a reading. She used to do readings out of, she used to do readings out of my brother's old bedroom. And, um... I asked her for a reading at nine and she told me that I was going to be famous. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, but she also told me that I was going, she told me a bunch of stuff that didn't make sense, but she, um, she also told me that I was going to be, that I was eventually going to grow up and give birth to twin girls. And I was like, okay, I'm nine and that's a heavy thing, so. <laughs> No, thank you. But then, but then uh, three, and also like my mom is a singer. Then like the the idea, like the game plan was that my mom was gonna sing in the subway until she was discovered, and then obviously she would be Whitney Houston, and then we'd be rich um, and happy, and then my dad and his second family could suck it. <laughs> but so I was like, no, you mean my mom's gonna be famous, right? And she's like, no, it's you. And I was like, you're insane. Um, but then three years later, she got pregnant with twin girls. And so I was like, okay, got it. You might be psychic, but you wrong still. <laughs> it's not me. My womb gonna be cool. And so, so, like I, so I never, again, like I never wanted to be famous or anything like that. So, but when I was 20 or so, 19 or so, maybe 18, I was walking around the streets of New York with my friend and this woman passed me like twice. And then came over and was like, hi, this is weird. Um, I don't do it for a living. I just have it, but I'm like psychic and I saw in your eyes that you're about to be famous. And I was like, ma'am, what are you talking about? And then she like gave me her number and she's like, call me. And I was like, sure, I'm gonna call you. Um, 
but she said, oh, she, my, my stepmother was like, you're going to be famous like Oprah. This woman said, you're going to be famous like Oprah. I see you talking to Oprah. And I was like, all right, ma'am. And then, so two years later, another woman passes me in the hallway and says, oh, I just came by like a bunch because I see in your eyes that you're going to be famous. And I was like, girl, for what? <laughs> <laughs> so over it these psychics yo so <laughs> so and I was like for what and she was like for your confidence and like at this point I was I had panic attacks pretty much every day I was so sick I was in therapy literally every day and I was like what confidence where um but I didn't say that to her. I was just like, sure. And she's like, yeah, I see you talking to Oprah one day. Um, an entire library will be listening to you. <laughs> but, but she said, you know, the world's gonna listen to you and I see you talk, I see you talking to Oprah. Um, and so then, so three years later, whatever, I randomly, weirdly uh, get precious. Um, which happens with like, like it's an insane, so I was, I auditioned on Monday, was hired on Wednesday, which I hear from other actors that that's not normal. <laughs> I don't know, what do I know, what do I know? But, <laughs> but um, and then we started shooting three weeks later, and then a year and a half later, I was nominated for an Oscar, but before the nomination, Oprah became a producer on Precious, after the fact. And then I went on her show, and I went on the show where she announced that she was retiring from the show. So I was just in time. <laughs> I was just in time for all three psychics to be right. Wow. Now, <laughs> who believes in psychics? Right? Show of hands, who believes in psychics? <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> well, but here's the thing. I mean, you have to back up a little bit okay, because <laughs> the story is, is amazing in the sense that, I mean, even as late as the day of the audition, you write about how you weren't even sure if you were going to go. Your mom almost got a role in this movie at one point. I mean, there was just such a set of coincidences, if you will, that led to you getting that role. Yeah, so yeah, also five years before our audition, my mom was approached to audition for the role of Mary that eventually went to Monique. And my mom like, was telling me that she wasn't going to audition. I was like, you're insane. Uh, you got to dream big, baby. And she, but she was like, you know, that's a, this woman is abusing her daughter. And I was an educator for so long that I don't want to be seen this way. Um, and she said, it should go to someone who we know isn't like that, it should go to Monique. And I was like, oh, you're insane. And she's like, well, here, read the book. And I was like, fine. And I read the book, and I was like, you're you still should do it. I believe in you. You know, it'd be fine. You have to, you, if, when opportunities come to you, you, you should say yes. And she's like, do you want me to see if they auditioned the girl yet? Do you want me to see if I can get you an audition? I was like, pass, because I wasn't an actress. And this is five years before. So then, when the audition came up again or whatever, somebody else told me about it, and I was just like, uh, and I, the book was in the house. I reread the first page, and then I left the house. I literally had class at the same time, and class was downtown, and the audition was uptown, and I went to leave on the downtown side of the street, and there was a movie filming in front of my building on the downtown side of the street. And I tried to walk through because I'm a goddamn New York, and I do what I want. <laughs> do what I want. Um, but someone, and I'll never forget it, this dude who's like, he, he's like dark skin with an afro and a leather jacket, because I think it was a period piece. It was, it was, a, it was Denzel Washington's American Gangster. And um, this guy like stopped me and had this, he had the nicest smile I've ever seen. And he's like, hey sister, we're actually shooting something. If you wouldn't mind, can you just cross over, to cross the street? And I was like, to the uptown side of the street? And he was like, yeah, could you do that? And I was like, "I right, then. And I did. And I thought, and I was like, look, everywhere you are, everywhere you go, there you are. And I like listened to the signs. This is a rainbow. I'm on the, the, the uptown side of the street when I don't want to be and I don't mean to be. I thought I should just go to that, that audition. And I did, and I I'd never had, I auditioned on Monday. I was hired on Wednesday. And there were how many young women who auditioned for that role? <laughs> 
I think, you know what, every, I swear to God, so one of the producers and directors there, they told me one number and then like every time they were um, asked, the number kept rising. <laughs> It's just like, it got up to like, four, I, I think the last number was something like 600 girls wow. were, um, were audition, auditioning for that role. Um, they actually, there was like a precious camp that was kind of uh, RuPaul's Drag Race slash America's Next Tap Model, but they put like 25 girls in a house or something, and then they just, every week, they like voted them out kind of thing I don't understand apparently there's footage of it I didn't see it because I didn't do the camp I just came in and I slayed <laughs> <laughs> yes you did yes you did alright so before you were precious you were Becky and I'm not talking about Becky on Empire I'm talking about Becky 1266 so you have to <laughs> You have to tell us how you got into the job of being Becky number 1266. Do you want to tell them what that means? What that job was? Well, as I understand it, someone suggested to Gabourey that she get into telemarketing, but when they said telemarketing, you heard... Phone sex. <laughs> I'm not mentally well, you guys. I hear what I want. So, so yeah, as it turns out, I was a, um, I searched for a job as a phone sex operator and I got it because I set goals and then I, I reach them. And, uh, so I, so like the thing about like, I, I mean like, I th okay, so there was an office, by the way, like there's an office building for phone sex. I mean, you could do it at home if you wanted to. But you get a you get a base pay <laughs> if you do it in an office building. So there's like I had to audition or interview for the job, uh, and I interviewed with the trainer supervisor. There's there's a human resources department. <laughs> there is you guys. There's human resource. There's the IT department. There are the operators who take the credit card information, and there are talkers. Now, if you're a woman coming into the job, you have to start as a talker. Um, and so I auditioned, and my audition name was Becky because um, I was 21 years old, so like this is real good. <laughs> like I'm, I'm in the pocket of making bad decisions, you guys. That's perfect. <laughs> Um, and I auditioned as Becky because the trainer who was training me said, oh, you got that high little girl voice. You're going to make a lot of money. Because, because, okay, this is like, this is, look, I didn't make this rules. Okay, things are racial, okay? Um, every, okay, everyone on the phone, uh, you have to be able to have a white girl's voice. Everybody on the phone is a white girl, unless otherwise specified. There are Latina, there's, there are Latina um, lines and Asian lines and black girls line, but you're only hired if you can have a white girl's voice. Now, the entire company is run by plus size black women who are all geniuses. <laughs> but, <laughs> It's, but all have the ability to sound white. And like, which is like, look, this is my voice, okay? This is my face, this is my voice. I've been called a valley girl my entire life. I was born in bed -Stuy. I was born across the street from Biggie. Like, I don't know why this is my voice. My dad has a French accent, my mom has a southern accent, and I went with valley girl. <laughs> we make choices. And so, on the phone, I'm Becky for audition, and like it's like this guy calls. I'm gonna get super graphic. Are there underage people in here? Shut up. Okay, then I won't. <coughs> I won't. Hey. <laughs> so, um, but I'm on the so like this is my Becky voice, which eventually it, once hired, I became Melody, who was number 1266 because I was the 1,266th employee hired. Just so we know. And my voice is somewhere around here because I like, um, <laughs> I go to college and I just started because I'm only, I'm like 18 years old. Uh, <laughs> and I have a roommate and she's like really cute and stuff, but like she's so goth. And so I like to like do her makeup and, um, <laughs> you know, I like to like 
do her hair. She had these like crazy bangs, and I had to like have her grow them out. See, like, also, if the thing is, you think that phone sex is about getting the collar off, it is not. It's about keeping the collar on. Because you can't make money when he hangs up. <laughs> okay? And it's like, he's paying $10 a minute. It's messed up, but I'm getting, like, 10 cents a minute for the first 10 minutes. But at the t- at the, after the first 10 minutes, and you get 20 cents a minute, and then 30. But if you, if the guy wants to talk to Melody1266, then he requests me and I make $2 before I even say hello. Mm -hmm. There are ways to make money, you guys. (laughs) (laughs) Meanwhile, and like, so like it's rows and rows and rows of like, there's a talker floor. Um, And there's rows and rows of computer and you're, there's like one every desk, one every, every other cubicle has a girl on it there's about you know 30 to 40 girls working at a time and so you have to be kind of quiet but you really just get on the phone and you talk about you read down a list of cosmo like like best ways to do you know get your man going or whatever you just read that yeah. list he doesn't know you're reading he can't see you <laughs> like i used to do this job drunk all the time you guys <laughs> the best phone calls were when i was drunk i didn't care but um but <laughs> So I did this for two months and then I was promoted to receptionist because again, there are other departments. It's not all phone sex, you guys. Mm. It's not. But yeah, I was a receptionist and then I got I was promoted again to operator who took the credit card numbers and pushed them through to different girls. But I only pushed them through to girls that I liked. Uh, because you could. Yeah, because it could. We're clicky, okay? We're clicky. <laughs> and, like, again, everybody was, like, a dope black woman. Like, a plus. And, like, the thing is, like, the guy's calling. He thinks he's talking to Megan Fox, but he's talking to Precious. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> and since you mentioned Precious, I want to cycle back to her for okay. a moment. Because after you shot the movie and you're waiting for it to come out, you have what you might call a defining moment. You're on your way to Lee Daniels' apartment, and you're gonna talk about this magazine cover. And, and, and you hear this conversation that you're not supposed to hear. Tell us about that. So, um, anybody ever heard of that little magazine called Vogue or something? <laughs> Vougua, what is it? <laughs> um, so the editor at large at the time or editor-in-chief was Andre Leon Talley. And this is after the movie shot, but before anyone's seen it. But Andre Leon Talley had seen the film over and over again. And uh, Lee Daniels, who is like a father to me, who, I mean, every yes I get in my entire career is because he said yes first. Um, he called me and he says, Andre Leon Talley loves you and wants to put you on the cover of Vogue. Um, and truthfully speaking, this didn't really mean anything to me at the time. I didn't know who Andre was. I didn't really know what Vogue was. Like my whole, I didn't care about fashion or any of that. But he was so excited. So I Googled it and I Googled Andre and I got excited. Like me on the cover of a magazine was amazing. You know, um, and he's like, come over. I have something to say. I have, you know, stuff to tell you because like this, this is like a super holding pattern, you guys. Like I'm not going to be like the regular like you know ink spot on society that everyone thinks I am because I live in Harlem because I'm dark skin and fat. I don't have to be this thing. I could be. I'm about to be Beyonce. Or, like, you know, I'm about to be, like, Halle Berry. I'm about to be an actor who's starring in the film. And there's this weird, like, holding pattern of, like, is it, am I really going to be that? Or will I forever be this other thing? And I felt like, no, I'm going to be that. I'm going to be an actress. I'm going to be on the, I'm going to do that. Like, ha, 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 you thought I was nothing, but I'm talented. And now I'm not fat anymore. And now I'm not ugly or any of the things you said I was anymore. I'm talented. And so I go over to Lee's house and I overhear, uh, he's on the phone, he's on speakerphone with Andre. And I can hear it because Lee's very loud. And I press my ear up to the door and I hear Andre say, that fat black bitch is going on the cover of a magazine. And it was like, oh, f- I'm going to be both? I'm going to be an ink spot and I'm going to be an actress at the same time? No, 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 no. I just wanted the other thing. I just wanted, you know, like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not that anymore. I'm not. But, like it, but I was and I am still. 
and I had to, and it was hard because, you know, words are, because the, the other thing is like, I didn't know Andre. I didn't know what he looks like. I didn't know him. He was a stranger. He was a stranger offering to put me on the magazine, but he was still a stranger until him calling me any of the things, any of the things that I survived being called in elementary and survived being called in junior high and high school because after high school, the world was normal. I wasn't this other, uh uh-uh, you, mm -mm. you're crazy if you call me fat. We both know. (laughs) Why are you saying that? You know, like that's that's for junior high schoolers. Um, But here I am now in Hollywood and now it's okay to say it again. And, but on the other side, like, I don't know if you know what Andre Leon Talley looks like, but he's gotta be like, he's gotta be like six, five, six, seven. He is black and he is pretty big. Um, And he, Yes, that Andre. <laughs> and he is in fat, and he rules the fashion world. He's a big, huge fat. But, like, I can't, but I think about how many thin, like, pale, I don't mean, like, white. I mean, like, literally, like, translucent, pale women with their rib cages showing in their class, which I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but that's not who he is. How many women he's put on the magazine that look the furthest from him, and I, here I am, I look like him. And so what, I mean, can I be offended by him wanting to put me on the magazine because I look like him? Is this the closest he'll ever be to being on this magazine? Mm. And like, and I, how many, if for, for the fashion industry, how many times has he been called a big fat bitch? A big fat black bitch. And so, but I I didn't know that then. And so I go, I hear this and I'm just, and whatever I thought the the photo shoot would be and whatever I thought the cover would look like was pop because because I I still had to be what they say. But that's the first story. (laughs) That's the first chapter in the book. It gets better. Tell them it's funny. (laughs) It's hilarious. You can see it's funny, right? (laughs) <laughs> well, and I just, I just want to ask you one other thing about that, Gabourey, and that is that you have a chapter in the book, MYOB, right? Mind Your Own Body. And I wonder, how do you handle, or how have you handled, the haters who just inevitably are out there on social media? Not just for you, but for everybody. For everyone. I have this, for a while, I was like, um, you were like, how do you handle the haters? And I'm like, oh, haters don't exist. They're, they're not real. They're like ghosts. Um, but they're real because I feel them and I get, I, I think there's, you know, there's, oh, you're so confident. You never get your feelings hurt. And it's like, no, no, no. Um, I'm not a robot. I get my feelings hurt and this is my body. And, uh, I actually love my body cause I love myself and I've gone through, you know, I've gone through real, real periods where I hated my body. Um, I hated it. It felt like an enemy. But my body has carried me through my entire life. And I had to, like, you know what I did? I don't know if anyone, I mean, like, look, we all deal with what we deal with. But, like, what what happened for me is I just started loving my body out loud. Like, I, I started, like, when I was in the shower, I would say, thank you, body, for getting me through the day. Thank you for carrying me. Thank you for not failing me. Thank you. And that's a, that, and that like trained me to love it and be appreciative of what I have because like, you know what? I think about all the things that I hate about myself that somebody else told me to hate. Like when I was in, I was like 12 years old and this girl in my junior high, she put her hand next to my hand her, her hand next to my hand on the desk and was like, oh my God, your hand is so big. That's her accent. <laughs> oh my God, your hand is like a monster. Your hand is like my hand's mom. <laughs> and then, so what I did at 13 years old is I started to hate my hand because a 13 year old girl told me to hate my hand. And so I just, like, if you just take a step back, from the things that bother you and figure out if they really bother you or if they bother somebody else, if somebody told you, you know? Because you, like I said, even if other people think they see you, they don't, you see you. Your opinion matters more than anything. And yes, I, people think, 
people think that I don't know what I look like or like, I mean, I was reading reviews. I was reading like comments, never read internet comments. Don't Google yourself. Um, I was reading internet comments about my body and then I would go and read internet comments about Quentin Aaron. Does anyone know who that is? Quentin Aaron was in the blind side with Sandra Bullock. He played the Michael Orr character. tall, super handsome, uh, don't tell him I said that, uh, black dude. And all of who, we have to be around the same size, if not, if him, not more. And all of his uh, comments was like, ooh, he's so handsome. Oh, I just love a big teddy bear. And um, ooh, damn, I love a big man. But my comments were like, why is she so big? She's an oil stain, like she's a whale, a gorilla. And I was like, is really the difference is that I don't have a pain? Like, is it it because I'm a woman? Because I'm a woman, my body, for some reason, is up for discussion? Is it? Because I, because what if I said no? You're not allowed to talk about my body for this, for the fact that, for the same reason I'm not allowed to talk about your parents or your, or your marriage or any of that, because it's none of my business. My body, just because you can see it doesn't mean it's any of your business, and I don't know why it bothers you that it doesn't bother me, but you need to chill. (laughs) I got so mad, you guys. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you what, before we go to our audience questions, I wanna give you an opportunity to describe yourself as you do in the book, and I'd love for you to just read this short um, passage that ends at the end. because I think it's, it's an awesome description of who you are. Oh man, I think I wrote this high on oxycodone. <laughs> I had like surgery and then I like, I had surgery and then I wrote two whole chapters high on oxycodone, you guys. It turned out well, it made it. Um, when I say that I'm beautiful, I don't say it so someone will clap and think I'm brave. I'm not doing it so that someone will comment on how confident I am. I don't say it with ego, and I don't say it defensively. I don't say it meaning that people who look like me are better than people who look like you. I say it because I believe it. I've earned every centimeter of my beauty. It has taken me years to realize that what I was born with, what was shaped, the mold it took, is all beautiful. I did not get this surgery to be beautiful. I had weight loss surgery. I did it so that I can walk around comfortably in heels. I want to do a cartwheel. I want to not be in pain every time I walk up a flight of stairs. I want to stop worrying about losing my toes. I know I'm beautiful in my current face and my current body. What I don't know about is the next body, the next face. I admit, I hope to God I don't get skinny. If I could lose enough to just be a little chubby, I'll be over the moon. I don't know what that will look like, my new face, my new body. Will I still be beautiful then? She, probably. (laughs) My beauty doesn't come from a mirror, never has and never will. Hi, my name is Sophia. Hi, Sophia. Hi. Um, First of all, thank you. I think you've inspired all of us. Um, My question is, I'm a Jewish religious girl, and the fact that you address your body is like a helper, a good friend, but it's not what defines you. You're beautiful because your soul is absolutely beautiful, and I think everyone here can agree to that because you just shine so brightly. Thank you. So my question is, uh, what is your beautiful soul's current challenge? What, what are the things that you're dealing with today and where do you want to be? You know, you're no longer anxious, God willing, and you're not depressed. So uh, what are your challenges today? Currently, I'm not depressed. I do know that it's something much like my, I, I'll probably have it forever. Um, thank God I can check in with it. And I figured, like the literal last, let me just read the last line of the entire well, the entire book is lastly a shout out to my therapist get that money girl <laughs> <laughs> because therapy is so important and i think that i think that as a black woman 
um, I wasn't allowed to know that therapy was an option and I needed it. I needed it as early as nine years old. And um, I, th I just think that like people of color, it's, it's hard to, to go to a doctor for something that you can't see, you know? Uh, and so I will always deal with depression and anxiety, but <laughs> I figured it, I can figure it out. I like, okay, I don't know if anyone believes in the power of stones, but I have so many stones in my bra and on my necklace. Um, I do a lot of the things to calm down because I'm very nervous, like this is different for me. I'm used to promoting a character, but the only character I'm promoting is me. And in the book, I've somehow uh, turned my family into characters. And I, I'm scared for people to read about them and make an opinion about them without the benefit of loving them the way I have, you know? Um, so that's what I'm currently uh, dealing with, but I'm figuring it out. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> so Lee Daniels from Philly, precious, important film. Um, what, what does Lee bring to your life? I mean, how, how have you changed as a human being from that life-changing moment, being in the film and, and being so close to Lee? I don't trust anyone's eye as much as I trust Lee's. Um, he's a visionary. He is a genius. He's a clumsy professor who is just like, you know, walking through life and he's, he's, it's almost like he's got a wand in his hand and he walks through a gray room and he, color here, color there, not color there, but color here. You know, he is a, he's, a, he's a wizard and what he's brought to my life is uh, even this conversation with you. You know, I, I really attribute everything. I, at some point I'm writing about him and I, and I say, you know, everything in my life right now, um, even writing on my laptop, my Upper West Side apartment is because he said yes first. And uh, he, in this way, yes, I work for everything that I have. I wrote every word of this book and I have my own talent and I have everything that I am is me but he opened a door. He opened a wide door and like you're all here because of the door that he pushed me through. Mm -hmm. and, um, and not only did he direct uh, and cast me in Precious, he also created Empire. And he, his fa it seems his favorite thing to do is to create, to, to create stars and to, and to give them an avenue to be artists. Uh, he did that with Jesse Smollett and uh, Bashir Gray or Yaz, who's Hakeem and Soraya and all of it, and Grace Gee, and Trey, Trey, every single portion, like every single person on Empire mm -hmm. and more. He's created more careers than, than can fit in this room. And that's the magic of him. Hi, my name is Eric. Um, I had the pleasure of seeing Precious at the Philadelphia Film Festival. Ali Daniels was there, another actress was there. You were supposed to be there, but he said you had to be on Good Morning America the next day. Um, Lee Daniels mentioned that he, such selected, a diva. He, sele <laughs> <laughs> he said he selected you for Precious because you were so unlike the character that you were going to portray. And my, I guess my question is, um, what would you say to people who were where you've been and stuck not making, make, able to make that transition that you have? Hmm. Hmm. I don't, you know what? Yes, I am very different than Precious, uh, the character, but I connected to her because I know what pain feels like. The thing about that character, the thing about that film is it's about pain. It's not about, it's not about being black, it's not being, about being poor or a woman or big or any of that. It is about pain and struggle. And that's why it was such a huge hit because everyone can connect to that kind of pain because we know what that feels like. We know what it feels like to be in the dark. We know what it feels like to want to hide. Even though, you know, it's, you know, we might not have all been abused the way she was. Um, we might not all be, you know, struck with the, with the disease that she was struck with, but we know pain. And that's what connected me to her. That's what connected an audience to, to the film. And so to people in, who, you know, who I guess want to become an actor, just find the connection. Even when you're so different, find the connection. 
Gabby. Hey, baby. Hi, I'm Amina. You're Mina? Amina. Amina. Oh, that's my little sister's name. Uh, <laughs> it's Aminata, and I'm, but she likes to go by Amina. I'm like, oh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My question is, when you did your book, and like, you explained, like, basically yourself, was that hard, like, to tell everybody all your struggles? Yeah, it's really hard. It's hard to be honest about anything you're struggling through, especially because I think that, like, people write... Um, I think people write memoirs and it, it's like, oh, that's what I went through. You know, that's what I survived. And, and this book is st stuff I'm going through today, you know. Um, and I kind of just, I wrote each chapter as if it were a diary entry. I kind of wrote in the dark. Um, and I didn't consider the audience. <laughs> and I, I joke that I wrote the book, uh, it's by me, for me, that I wrote it for myself because I had things to work out. And, um, and I kind of wrote that my friend, who's a writer, uh, was like, I'm really scared. I don't think I can write a book. And he's like, write it, and then you don't have to sell it if you don't want to. And so I kind of just did that. Um, yeah, that's what I did. And so it's really hard to do that. It's actually, it makes it so much easier if you just write or writing for yourself. The audience will either come or they won't or it'll be what it is, but the work that you're doing in um, each line of the book is the important stuff. If you're a writer, if, you're, um, if you wanna be a writer or you're an aspiring writer, it means you are a writer currently, then it's just about each word uh, and it's about being honest, as honest as possible. You don't have to share your honesty. You don't. I did, but you don't. Wow, thanks for coming. And uh, what an amazing article in the New York Times. Pages, Thank pages. You. So um, if I'm not mistaken, it said that your grandmother was famous and she was one of the co-founders of Ms. Magazine? My aunt. Your My aunt. aunt is Dorothy Pittman Hughes, who right. founded uh, Ms. Magazine with Gloria Steinem. Right. How did that come about? What's I don't the story know. That's their story. That? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's them. That's on them. <laughs> Although we, I truly don't know. And I I'm just as interested in my aunt as everyone else is, which is not. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I didn't ask. I didn't even, I didn't even know until I was like 20. <laughs> like, wow. And there was, I think, a picture of you with Gloria Steinem, right? In the New yeah, York Times? Yeah, because Gloria Steinem used to hang out at the house. Like, she was just my auntie's friend. I like, there's just so, like, the blissful ignorance of, like, children. I, like, really wish I paid attention. You know what? Hey, if I can tell you anything, go out if you still have parents or old people in your life. Not that sounds rude. <laughs> That sounds rude, but like an older generation in your life, ask them really, really uncomfortable questions. I, like, I mean, there's so many things that I had to learn, but I had to ask first. They wouldn't just offer the information. Yeah, you're right. Hey, Gabby, this is Yes, Mom. Hi. Oh, hi. Hi, <laughs> hi. Mrs. Yes, Mom. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask you a question because I know I always talk to him about how do he come out of character after working, after y'all work 12 hours, 16 hours a day? Um, how do you manage to come out of character? Hmm. And, and because sometimes I know that's hard to do. Um, I don't know. I think if you don't get, mm -hmm, I don't want to say if you don't get too deep in, in the first place. Uh, well, there are people that are method actors who, you know, what, whatever role they're doing, they're, that's their role at home for the duration of the shoot. Uh, I believe, like, Jim Carrey is like that. And if anyone's ever seen him be the Riddler... Or the Grinch, you're just like, really? You were taking that down to that Sunday at brunch? You were the Grinch? <laughs> Seems inconvenient, but okay. Um, I just, I, for me, I kind of, I have the ability to, I mean, like there was, okay, even when we were shooting Precious, Precious has, Precious's voice sounds different than mine. Um, she articulates in a very different way than I do. Um, was deeper, all of these things. And there were these scenes, they never quite made it. They never made it because it didn't make sense. But there were scenes where 
Lee would have me deliver, like you, there were voiceovers in the film, and I would deliver those voiceovers to camera. Uh, and so, and I'd be looking right into the camera, and so he would tell me, Gabby, cut yourself. Like, so when you're done, you say cut. And I would say something like, um, this must be what white people feel like at Christmas time. Cut! <laughs> like, because that's my voice. The second I was done with the line, I was done with the character. I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be a crafty talking like, that's weird for me. I'm just like, I feel like I have a very, very strong sense of self. I know who I am. And I think that that's part of it. I think that if you don't know who you are, it's very easy to lose yourself in this character for six months or, you know, or whatever. And then this for, you know, seven weeks or whatever. But I know who I am and I prefer me. And that's no shade to any character I've ever played. I just like, I just prefer me. Yeah. No all. character hangover. No kid. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. So I think it's. I think that. But like, Yaz is young too. Like he's a baby still. Um, <laughs> I don't care how old he is. He's still a baby. <laughs> he's a little, little baby. And he's. Um, he. I mean, he's still obviously, and not, that's not like, it's not like a comment on his maturity. He's very mature, but he still has growing up to do just because chronologically he's young and he'll figure it out. Hi, Gabby. My name is Malou and I love you. I loved you and everything that I've seen you in. I love the character of Becky. And one of my questions um, that I have for you today is when Becky got her man, on Empire, when she got to be physical and show that adult side of herself, you know, being in a relationship. Um, how did you feel as an actor? Were you excited? Was there any anxiety about, you know, depicting that part of your character, of showing that part of yourself, or were you excited? Major anxiety. So this is a story that I don't, um, I really want to not tell you guys, but um, y'all know I ain't right in the head, so here we are. <laughs> Um, I, so that, that scene was, uh, <laughs> super fun, and, it, and that episode was directed by Mario Van Peebles, who is very, he's, se he's sexy, <laughs> but he's sexy, and like, and on top of that, Mo McCray, who played Becky's boyfriend, he, I, um, and <laughs> he's sexy also, he's very tall, and like, that's, kind of the way I like him. I like his dark skin, I like it, I like it. Um, but, but I'm very nervous, and like you would think, I think people thought, oh, it's her first, no, it wasn't my first sex scene at all. Um, but I was still very nervous, and we were on a rooftop, and I had, I had these like acrylic nails, like I do right now. So then my, because I'm still like running from that 13 year old bitch that said my hands were fat. <laughs> The nails make them look less sausagey. Anyway, um, when the director, Mario, said, we got to the rooftop, and he's like, okay, um, let's rehearse the scene. And when he said rehearse the scene, I got so nervous. My body violently shook like I was hit by a lightning bolt. So hard and so fast. Nobody saw it, but my nail popped off. <laughs> I'm so serious, you guys. It like popped, it went pink, like popped off. And I like had to, it was, I was, I, I'm like really good at leaning in. Like something's going weird, whatever. We all know it's weird. I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna, the only thing through, the only way through it is through it. So I kind of pretended everything was fine and I did the scene and eventually I like, I, I relaxed because it's fun. And that guy's fun and Mario's fun and there's like a whole crew of, crew of people watching it and it's all good and that dude's sexy and I just was saying the filthiest things to him. I mean, the, <laughs> the, whoa, the worst things. I mean, the, <laughs> I hope that they end up somewhere because like, <laughs> I like, it's somebody, I'm like lay, laying on, I'm like not even like, he rolls me over, I'm like sitting on him and like, <laughs> I'm like sitting on him and I like put my hand on his face and I was like, are you keeping my seat warm? <laughs> like, I know. I know, phone sex, you guys. I still keep the tricks. I still keep the tricks. <laughs> so dirty. So yeah, it was fine. <laughs> well, on that note. <laughs>
Join me in thanking Gabourey Sidibe for being with us and showing us your stuff.